All right, well, welcome to chapter 26. Um, you might hear some noise because uh, Doofus is in the house over here. You remember Triple D, the dumb, dumb dog? Right, Chevy Dog? Huh? <coughs> exactly. <clears throat> so uh, if you hear any noise in the background, it's because the grandchildren are uh, in and they're offloading some essential groceries that uh, my daughter and my wife had to go get because it's been a couple weeks now and I imagine for everybody you know you just eventually have to venture out um, so they made the Walmart Walmart run uh, and uh, I, I, I did that once already I guess you're supposed to recommend only one person do it but we get a little stir crazy so we're kind of taking turns because I don't know about you but this is getting kind of old I mean uh, trying to find ways to stay entertained is getting a little uh, uh, tricky let's just say yeah, but I got to admit I'm enjoying the time with the grandchildren uh, as the weather improves I'm thinking about taking them out on a survival exercise I thought maybe I could drop them off in the woods for a couple of days and see how they may do see which ones you know make it but I don't know we'll see uh, you know good times so, well, speaking of good times, uh, hopefully you're having a good time studying uh, chapter 26. And these are the learning objectives you should be learning. And we're going to jump in. And we're going to talk about the different classifications of uh, visual acuity. Now, first off, 2020 vision we know is the uh, basic norm for visual acuity. You can then move from that to either being hyperopia or myopia. Hyperopia is farsightedness. That's difficult seeing things up close. Now, don't confuse that with presbyopia. Presbyopia, we said before, is the hardening of the ciliary muscles in which uh, you can't focus as well. And that's eyes over 40. So presbyopia is just aging eyes, where hyperopia is actually difficult seeing things up close. You're farsighted. So think of, you know, hyper, like hypertension. Hypertension, you have, uh, it's high. Well, think high, far, you know, uh, those things go hand in hand. So far-sighted means hyperopia. Myopia would be nearsightedness or difficulty seeing things that are far away. So you can see things up close. Uh, if that's distracting, I'm sorry, just people in the background because we've got people here at the house. So not sure, uh, but to be fair, if that's my daughter, I, I kind of walked through a couple of her videos for her high school students. So uh, it's just hard to know, and I apologize for any interruptions. If some grandchildren come busting in a door or some dog starts uh, going crazy. Now, uh, astigmatism, uh, astigmatism is a uh, irregular curvature. Uh, that's a, an irregular curvature of the uh, of the cornea itself and because the cornea itself is irregular that will warp the visual field and uh, cause a uh, an area that can that makes it um, for uh, unfortunately for visual disturbances so and uh, and you can see more that occurs also also you get more astigmatism as you grow older as well now, luckily, we can do things like artificial lenses, glasses, uh, which have been around for a very long time, that can do corrective vision, that can correct the, uh, the disorders of uh, myopia and uh, uh, also hyperopia. Then, of course, uh, we use reading glasses for presbyopia, so there are things that can be done, lenses. If you look at the top of the page 598 on your textbook, you can see how the lens of the eye is designed to focus everything right on the retina at the back of the eye. 
And what happens with hyperopia, the lens is too close to the retina, so therefore the focal point actually converges beyond the uh, where it should, beyond the retina. And with myopia, the lens is too far away, and the focal point is, is before the retina. So the lenses then in turn adjust it so that the focal point is right where it needs to be. And that allows everything to come into focus. And that's how prescription uh, artificial lenses work. Um, so it's a real good illustration right there in your text on page 598. Uh, also, you can do corrective surgery uh, can be performed now. Um, the cataract surgery can be done, LASIK, uh, and maybe some of you have already had this. Uh, it's becoming very more commonplace now all, um, where people are just having the uh, surgery. Um, and it's very common for nearsightedness uh, here in the United States. And it works well, um, but you do have to make sure, you know, you always check out who you're going to because there are complications that can occur with this type of surgery. So your patients have to be uh, fully aware of that as well. Now, corneal disorders. Um, for uh, uvitis, uvitis is an inflammation of the uveal tract. Um, can result in allergies and infection. Um, other things like uh, viruses can cause uvitis. Uh, the uveal tract consists of the iris and the ciliary body and the chiroid. Uh, dry eye can occur in people. Uh, you see that advertised on commercials a lot about uh, dry eye. Of course, there are medications that can be given and lubricating drops that can be administered for. Um, so you can use things like artificial tears. And of course, uh, keratitis is an inflammation of the cornea. Uh, this is caused by irritation or infection. All too often, the type patient that would succumb to this type of uh, injury are stroke patients. And you ask yourself why? Well, think about it. If you say you had a stroke on the right side of your brain, your left side of your body starts does fails to uh, function properly because that's the definition of a stroke is residual deficits. You then might not be able to close that left eye completely or that left eye might not blink as frequently as it used to, making that eye more susceptible to um, irritation, uh, infection, and uh, other complications. So people who have strokes, people who wear contact lenses are more susceptible to infection or inflammation of the cornea. And they're especially susceptible to corneal uh, ulcerations, contact lenses. And this is why I personally hate contact lenses, by the way, because then as, as, as an ER provider, I have seen some severe, severe uh, cor cor corneal ulcerations to the point where uh, my soldiers almost lost their eye. And uh, consequently, uh, you have to send them. What you do is you, you treat them, obviously, immediately, but you quickly, quickly send them to an ophthalmologist for a follow-up consult. And because uh, a cor corneal uh, ulceration can be a severe infection and that might require even some uh, surgical intervention. Now, um, speaking of surgery, I spoke earlier about uh, uh, the type, different types of uh, surgery that can be uh, performed. And if you look on page 599, you can actually see what some of those surgeries would look like with the sutures, you know, um, the you know, a corneal transplant, for example. And, and how it's supposed to look. And then in acute transplant rejection, you can see the swelling and puffiness in the second photo. And that's a, that's a really good uh, illustration uh, for uh, uh, eye surgery. So uh, they understand that um, corneal transplants are done quite often now. Uh, they're harvested from a donor cadaver. 
um, and uh, they can save it could go a long way for saving people's eyesight uh, so if you find yourself uh, caring for someone you, it's a specialty so you just you definitely need to uh, know uh, what to do and how to care for the, the uh, person um, the usually the dressings are uh, maintained and cared for by the provider uh, it's rare for the nurses to actually uh, deal with uh, uh, these type of scenarios, Especially, you know, unless it's a specialty unit. Okay. I already spoke uh, pretty detailed about corneal ulcerations. We already just went over the corneal transplant. Um, correctly marked surgical site. Now, here's the thing. Every surgery. And if you become an OR nurse or you become part of an OR team, you're going to lose it. They do what's called a timeout. Uh, the timeout is to stop. Everyone literally stops. They time out. They stop what they're doing, and they verify that what the procedure is. So why? Because historically, we've accidentally performed surgery on the wrong side of the body. And when a patient's underneath a surgical drape, it's very easy to get confused. Believe it or not. Um, so always know that you have to correctly mark the surgical site and take a time out uh, prior to commencing with the procedure. Care of an artificial eye. Now, I don't know if my links will play while I'm recording, but if they don't, just go to the regular PowerPoint of this, which should still be uploaded, and connect to the link. Or simply Google artificial eye. And you can, I mean, there are so many videos out there on the care and maintenance of artificial eyes. They are not, our artificial eyes are not round. They're not like, they're not like you see on TV where they fall up, pop out of the person's eye and roll across, across the floor. They're actually more shaped like a saucer or a dish. And uh, that kind of wedge in, it's, it's more like a curve and it kind of wedges into the socket of the eye and then it stays in place. So consequently, uh, the best way to get used to seeing what an artificial eye looks like is to Google it and look at the prosthetic. Uh, and watch the usually the owner will put their eye in themselves if you don't know what you're doing don't do it don't attempt it let them show you let them guide you all right and so uh, let's see I will try to see if it'll work Guess not. Yeah, sorry. All right. I wasn't sure if the links would work while I was doing the recording. I apologize for that. Um, I do embed some links in this that I think are really good, uh, especially when we start getting to the other procedures. Okay. So make sure you uh, go out, exit, and go into the regular PowerPoint and connect and see if they work for you there. All right, uh, eye trauma. There's various types of eye trauma. One of the most is uh, just a basic foreign body. I'm sure by now, it, you know, especially during the summer season, all of you have had some type of foreign body. I mean, how many of you have had just being outside and had a gnat, one of those little bugs just fly right into your eyeball when you're out, you know, you're sitting there being good and in your deer stand trying to be quiet and or uh, you got all these gnats just buzzing around your head and flying into your eye uh, yeah probably God's way of telling you not to hunt I don't know but at the end of the day um, the best way to remove a foreign body from the eye is irrigation because if, if it's not uh, if, if, if you can't flush it out with irrigation, 
then you don't take it out. Because here's the thing, if you can't flush it out, if it's not just laying on the surface of the eye and you can irrigate it off with copious amounts of ideally normal saline, also ideally at a comfortable room temperature as to not burn or sometimes too cold on the eye, if you ever try that, oh my God, that hurts. Um, you can actually flush with just tap water, put them underneath the sink. Copious amounts of water through the eye uh, to flush it. And if it's on the surface of the eye, it'll wash away. If it's embedded into the eye, now we're talking apples and oranges. You do not try to remove an embedded object that is in the eye. That is provider only. And that's not even your regular providers. An ER provider will not attempt to remove something from that's embedded into an eyeball. They will consult to a, an ophthalmologist, a specialist, to get that taken care of. Um, burns, chemical burns to an eye. Chemical burns to an eye, once again, copious irrigation, normal saline. And when I say copious, I mean copious. You have got to remove the chemical agent. Um, normal saline is your preferred solution. If all else fails, tap water will suffice. But copious irrigation for burns or chemical burns or splash burns to the eyes. That's why you see what the eye stations, think about it, when you're in chemistry class, what was it? It was just a fountain with two things that spewed up water and you put your eyes into the the water that's and you just keep your eyes and you keep constantly blinking that is copious irrigation all right a nucleation that is the removal of the eye now uh, typically uh, this obviously this is a surgical procedure um actually i i had a friend who had his eye removed he uh, dumbass man he had a hot, hot round on, a, on an M60, and you're supposed to let it cool off. You never open that plate until you give it, let it sit there for like five minutes and cool off because you got to jam around. You open it, and guess what? A hot round can explode, and sure enough, they, he opened it, exploded right in his face, shrapnel, took out his eye, and he lost his eye and had to have a nucleation. But he did look like a badass with the, uh, I mean, he had that whole pirate thing going in. And Special Forces, that's a pretty cool look. So, uh, uh, you know, there is that positive aspect. But yeah, yeah, Torpa's face, too, really didn't help him with the ladies much. But I will say, um, you know, attention to detail. He didn't follow proper procedure. And consequently, he blew up his face. So, uh, lesson learned, attention to detail, follow procedure. Don't blow up your face. Good. Uh, care of the artificial eye. I already told you to Google that and uh, you know check it out. Cataracts. Cataract is the opacity of the lens that produces an effect similar to uh, one person experience when looking through a sheet. In other words, it's like this fogging or clouding of the eye lens that happens over time, usually as you get older, and it eventually takes away your vision. It gets everything just gets so cloudy you can't see. It's like trying to see through a dense fog. Um, it's it's almost in, impossible. Now there's congenital uh, cataracts. This is most commonly caused by maternal infection. <clears throat> this is why we treat the eyes as soon as a child is born. Uh, excuse me, because they pass through the uh, birth canal and uh, their face is getting smeared with anything. And of course, stuff can get into their eyes. So one of the things that you see done in your OB is you'll see how the, the uh, eyes are treated in newborns right away to prevent any types of toxoplasma um, uh, from or rubella or any type of infection period from now it doesn't help with viruses but it will help with any type of uh, uh, bacteria now 
traumatic cataracts can occur as well and that could be a physical blow well what's a common physical blow before the advent of uh, racquetball glasses racquetball you know or a tennis ball uh, those type things would uh, can cause serious uh, trauma to an eye so uh, of course you might want to know that cigarette smoking can actually increase your risk for developing cataract over time so uh, that's important to know. So if there was a disconnect there, a little glitch, I apologize. Uh, don't know what happened here. All of a sudden the computer went a little haywire on me. I apologize. Uh, I think we were left off on traumatic cataracts and I said some of the things that can cause it, you know, like an impact to the eye, a, a racquetball, a tennis ball, a blow. Uh, also, exposure physical exposure to sunlight uh, uv um, heat chemical toxins cigarette smoking cigarette smoking puts you at higher risk for uh, developing cataracts uh, so does heavy drinking some of the things that you might see with the signs and symptoms of cataracts would be things like uh, uh, well photophobia is a big one um, diplopia uh, double vision blurred vision so any visual disturbances in a patient you want to suspect, uh, especially as they're getting older, geriatric patients, hazy, blurred, uh, complaining of glare, nearsighted, my increasing nearsightedness, complaints of that the colors aren't as crisp or clear, they're starting to fade, uh, a desire to turn on the lights or a desire to want the lights up at a higher brightness because they can't quite see as well. And frequent changes in their prescription uh, for their eyeglasses. These are all signs and symptoms of uh, cataracts. And of course, uh, you know, obvious things we want to do. We want to encourage uh, wearing of sunglasses, prevention, quit smoking. Um, uh, you know, obviously, uh, if you're going to be outside, they need to protect their eyes, protect their skin as well, but you need to protect their eyes and sunglasses. If you got to wear glasses, get glasses that change automatically, and that, that goes a long way to preventing and helping you. And nowadays, they're really not that much more money. Uh, we talked about the congenital and traumatic, and we also talked about the aging, so I think we've covered that pretty detailed. Wow, I really, really want you guys to watch this video. And you're not going to play for me, are you? No, you're not. You hateful. This is a good video on, uh, uh, anime, uh, and, 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 you know, so go take the time to step out and, uh, and watch it. I, I think it's uh, some of these, uh, in the embedded videos in this class, I think, I think are some of the best. Uh, it talks about the treatment and goes over the... Uh, you know the surgery that is performed for cataracts and i already talked about all these signs and symptoms are also located on page 602. all right i apologize for the choppiness of this uh presentation i've been i don't know what's going on with my computer i, I, I keep losing you periodically and it's stopping in the recording i'm not really sure what's happening here um but with the treatment you know that cataract surgery is performed with the uh as the vision is lost They'll go in, they'll remove the lens, the old cloudy lens, and they'll just put a new lens in. This used to be very major surgery, cutting edge, way back in the day. And now it's really not that big of a deal. It's same day surgery. Uh, you're in, you're out, and you're sent home. So um, uh, not, not a major issue. Um, pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, glaucoma. Now I can tell you, the upcoming embedded video on this is extremely google open angle versus closed angle glaucoma and there's a couple different videos that'll come up watch them they are some great videos to explain uh the whole aspect of uh, gla of, of glaucoma and the etiology now, as the pressure builds in the anterior chamber of, uh, of, of glaucoma, the, it's pushing back and the lens gets pushed back into the posterior chamber and that puts pressure uh, then 
on the basically the back of the eye and that whole um, back of the eye then cuts off the blood flow because the pressure becomes too great for the little capillary bed and you end up with vision loss and the best way to see it is through uh, the videos uh, especially the best way to see the uh, open angle versus uh, increased interocular pressure greater than 20 really needs to be treated uh, period uh, greater than 20 millimeters of mercury and you, that needs to be checked on a regular basis usually annually uh, so you should be getting eye exams uh, especially as you're older on a uh, regular basis you definitely need to know the difference between open angle glaucoma and, and uh, closed angle or narrow angle glaucoma so um, with open angle, especially if you look on page 605, you can see that the angle uh, between the iris and the cornea is open, allowing the outflow of the aqueous humor through the canal. And that, and that it's just, you're getting too much uh, uh, of the aqueous humor is not being resorbed enough and it starts to build up and you get too much pressure. Where in the closed angle, narrow angle, if you look at the picture to the right, it's almost like a dam. In other words, the, the channel is too small for the aqueous humor to flow through and be reabsorbed. So it can't flow through. So it starts to build up. And once it builds up that pressure, it pushes on the cornea and it, put, it causes all the uh, complication. Closed angle is a medical emergency event uh, because you can, if you gave the pressure can build up so fast that uh, they can actually lose their eye. So uh, open angle is uh, much more um, common. Uh, the, uh, so therefore it's uh, the most common cause, open angle or chronic glaucoma, uh, in which there is uh, no angle closure is much more insidious. And therefore it happens over long term. There's no pain and uh, 90% of glaucoma is caused by the open angle or chronic glaucoma. It's inherited and uh, often seen in you know, families. However, though, it, uh, it's usually bilateral, but it can, if left untreated, it can progress to complete blindness. Uh, so you do need to get that exam on a regular basis to make sure. As I said, the interocular pressure is how you determine and diagnose. Uh, a closed angle acute glaucoma is a medical emergency and needs to be treated immediately. Uh, open angle is also a, um, a very important uh, disorder of the eye and left untreated can lead to uh, loss of sight as well. So both are extremely important. I believe on this, if you click on the word types, if you notice it's got a different color to the text type, I think that's the link to the uh, video on the outside over in YouTube. So in regular PowerPoint, click on that and it should take you to the video and then watch the video. I cannot tell you, um, I, I think it does a really good job of explaining open versus closed angle glaucoma okay as i said before open angle is uh, hereditary usually bilateral can lead to complete blindness uh, it starts with mild symptoms but can go, cause a very serious uh, visual impairment including losses risk factors for glaucoma is diabetes it's higher in african americans and of course any family history of glaucoma uh, uh, of course, you can perform surgical interventions, and all too often, uh, open angle glaucoma is treated uh, medically with a uh, medication regimen. Uh, post procedure care if they do have a surgical intervention, obviously, you don't want to create anything that will cause an increase in the intracranial pressure, so therefore, you don't want any bearing down uh, or any Valsalva maneuvers. As I said before, closed angle glaucoma is a medical emergency. This will cause severe pain. With open angle, there is no pain. It progresses over time. Closed angle progresses rapidly.
and it's a, the pressure goes up quite a bit. Uh, if you start getting interocular pressures of 50 to 70, they're going to lose their eye. You have to intervene. All right, as I said, treat it as an emergency and uh, they need emergency medical treatment. Uh, retinal detachment. Retinal detachment can occur uh, spontaneous. Maybe some of you have known someone who's experienced a retinal detachment. It can occur with aging. Uh, it can uh, be secondary to trauma to the eye, or it can be secondary to a disease process. Or you can just have primary retinal detachment where you have retinal detachment uh, literally on its own. So that's how they're classified. They're classified as either primary, where it's uh, self-induced. Uh, the primary retinal detachment is a result of spontaneous detachment or degenerative changes in the retina itself. And then secondary is secondary to some other type of etiology, whether it be trauma or um, some other ophthalmic uh, event. Uh, retinal detachments are seen in people more often in Jewish descent. Also, it's uh, rarely, uh, it's very infrequent in African Americans. Uh, myopia is a common risk factor for retinal detachment. And if you remember from the beginning of the lecture, what is myopia? That's right, myopia would be nearsightedness, nearsightedness. You can see here the retina is detached. All too often they'll, they'll, they'll tell you because wherever the retina is detached, they can't see. So it's imagine if you would pulling down a shade and that shade is cutting across and everything above that is blacked out. And they only can see below that shade, right? That tells you, hey, if you got someone saying, I, I can only see, you know, one half, uh, everything else is black, right? Well, that tells you, you better start thinking oh, that my patient's got a retinal disease. That's an emergency. Got to get, take, get them taken care of immediately. It can be a gradual onset where it starts and it's the, the, the retina starts just peeling away, like wallpaper peeling off a wall, or very slowly. Or it can be sudden, where it drops all at once. Uh, they can have flashes of light and color. Uh, they could have floaters. They could have these type things might be... Uh, early onset and they might uh, predispose you know, in other words it's something that they might see prior to the retina becoming detached itself or they might end up having a complete detachment treatment laser therapy cryotherapy scleral buckling and google these uh, they're pretty cool in their own right as to how they go about treating especially the scleral buckling i think is a really neat uh, technique where they band the eye and that puts pressure, which helps keep the retina pushed up against the back of the eye. Obviously, you want to keep the patient in the proper position. Uh, you, you want to administer proper uh, ophthalmic medications and you want to maintain uh, pain control. Okay, well, what leads to retinopathy? Well, diabetes and hypertension are two. You've heard of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, it is very common. Um, diabetes uh, and hypertension lead to the destruction of the capillary bed over time and as such uh, that destruction leads to problems. You get diabetes, you know, uh, you, you can get diabetic neuropathy, you get diabetic retinopathy. So these things uh, make the patient at a higher risk for experiencing these complications. So the diabetics, you have two types of uh, retinopathy, non-proliferic and proliferic. And if you look at um, the two major uh, types um, that you see, the proliferic and non-proliferic, the non-prolific type of retinopathy is these microaneurysms that uh, develop in the retinal blood vessels. Uh, they eventually swell and rupture. They cause hemorrhage in the uh, in, inside the vitreous humor, which interferes with the vision. 
The prolific form of retinopathy occurs later. Uh, this occurs later in uh, diabetics. Uh, new blood vessel growth occurs existing in the retinal vessel, and the process is called neovascularization. These new blood vessels, though, are much thinner and fragile, and so consequently they have a tendency to rupture and cause more hemorrhage. And uh, that leads to, once again, the uh, retinopathy that occurs. And so what do we do? Well, tight glycemic control is the key. Uh, you really want to maintain and manage their blood pressure and their diabetes. That's what we do for patients. Um, so I, sign symptoms, blurry vision. If you notice, a lot of these sign symptoms are visual disturbances. So once patients are having visual disturbances, it's not up to you to decide, hey, what's causing a visual disturbance. It's up for you to make sure that a patient goes to the right doctor, so that right provider then. Okay, so if you, if you ever have patients that are experiencing visual disturbances, they need to be treated. That's, an, that's a symptom of an underlying, some type of underlying etiology. Something is going on. And if you don't treat it, you know, relatively soon, they can lose their sight. Um, they could then get macular involvement, and uh, once you start getting into things like macular degeneration, retinal detachment, they can lose their vision permanently. Okay, so what did I say? We want to maintain proper blood pressure, maintain proper glucose levels. That's it. Macular degeneration. There are two types of macular degeneration, wet and dry. Dry is a gradual blockage of the capillaries that kills the rods. The capillaries aren't getting the blood. The uh, cells aren't getting the blood. And you end up with an atrophy that is a high percentage of your geriatric patients that are experiencing macular degeneration are experiencing dry. And this is insidious. So it occurs over time. Um, all you can really do for this is, uh, you know, vitamins and uh, try to slow the progress. Wet is an abnormal vessel growth and burst, that neovascularization that we talked about before. And that is much more prolific and leads to loss of vision much faster than dry. Signs, symptoms, loss of color, blurred vision, distortion, of objects especially they look wavy um, so there are things you can do to help uh, they can do exercises for their eye actually uh, and they'll be instructed by the ophthalmic uh, AL, um, ophthalmologist if you look on page 613 it covers the Amsler grid used to check for macular, de macular degeneration and it tells you how you can how you can use that, and it gives you how the lines are uh, will show as uh, the patient will see not straight but wavy. Um, the this should be done by a uh, ophthalmologist. Also, when looking in the eye, you can see uh, this yellow exudate that builds up on the inside of the eye. And that, when you're visualizing it, is known as uh, uh, drusen. They are found beneath the retinal pigmentation of the epithelium. This represents an um, extracellular debris, and it's common in the, uh, the wet uh, macular degeneration. So here's a video uh, that you can click on and watch. I think I'm closing in on the end, so once again, that usually gets choppy. So if this is my last slide, I'll, I'll put up a question slide to finish off. Nope, not yet. So uh, we continue on. Well, obviously anybody who has any type of visual disturbances, we want to make sure that uh, you are taking care of them. Uh, one of the things is obviously is uh, they'll be more prone for injury. Uh, if you can't see well, you're at a higher risk for falls, bumping into things, tripping over things, and just generalize injuring yourself. Oh, hearing. I almost forgot about the whole ear side of this. Uh, well, the big ones are external infection and internal infection. External otitis is common among swimmers. 
they get bacterial fungal infections in the external ear canal. It can hurt uh, and uh, be very painful. It's usually treated with an antibiotic or an antifungal drop into the ear. Then we have otitis media. Otitis media is an internal ear infection. Uh, middle ear infection can be the virus or bacteria. In children, it's actually more common to be virus and will just run its course. Although every parent going wants antibiotics for the children, otherwise you just haven't treated them. So uh, you just have to be careful with that uh, toxicity. And of course, we talked before about the surgical, if your child has three or more ear infections in a set period of time, that they might be a candidate for the tubes in their ear. And this is just a link discussing and talking about that. Lambertitis is a uh, complication or bacterial. Uh, it can become with uh, meningitis, uh, otitis media, uh, basically uh, viral infection, mumps. It's an inflammation of the labyrinth in the inner ear. And this is where your balance and sensorial. <coughs> These people experience tinnitus, vertigo, severe uh, dizziness with nausea and vomiting. And that is severe vertigo. If you've ever experienced vertigo, oh my gosh, not fun. All right, trust me on that. So what do you want to do? You want to treat them symptomatically until the underlying, if it's a, if it's a, you might want to go ahead and put them on antibiotics because you don't know if it's a bacterial infection or viral. So you treat for bacterial and um, hope that it just runs its course and you treat symptomatically. <clears throat> Meniere's syndrome. This is increased fluid within the space of the labyrinth and it also causes the vertigo. Uh, the, uh, this leads to the dizziness, the nausea, vomiting, uh, the tinnitus, and obviously anything that's going to coordinate your inner ear being off balance, throw you off balance, will make you uh, loss of coordination, dizzy, nausea, vomiting. You can do the caloric test, by the way, where you, um, uh, the caloric test is where you instill water into the ear and they'll experience uh, nystigmas. So you might want to read up on that. Uh, autosclerosis is uh, the hardening, difficulty of hearing others, uh, uh, yet they can hear their own voice fine. <clears throat> this is a sensorium versus conduction. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's hereditary. It's a degeneration of the bone. So since the bone degenerates, you lose the conductivity because the vibrations, even though they're vibrating against the tympanic membrane, the bones aren't transmitting, right? Remember the hammer anvil stirrup? They're not transmitting that vibration. So therefore, you get a loss of hearing. But they can hear themselves fine because they're actually hearing that internally. All right. Understand what you need to do for uh, surgical patients. For okay, so that concludes uh, this week on uh, sensory eye and ear. Uh, we have urinary tract next week, which will be two chapters, and then that'll be that'll be it. Then after that, we just have review and preparation for final exam. So if you have any questions, uh, we will talk uh, every Thursday. I will link on bring up uh, you can join in the meeting on Thursday at 12 all right hold your questions till then look forward to talking to you and seeing you again stay safe take care